good evening everyone uh, uh, from uh, the warm confines of mumbai i am uh, here with adam Sing Sing singolda the founder and ceo of tabula uh, adam is based in new york and as he tells me it's been a snowy uh, morning there it's been snowing overnight and he's just woken up to a white blanket of snow all around him adam welcome to the show uh, this is our uh, weekly uh, martech leadership series and we are very happy to have you on the show for those of you uh, I'm sure none of you needs an introduction to Tabula, but uh, for those of you who, who might want to know a little bit more, just to give you a brief background, Tabula helps uh, publishers drive engagement, advertisers to surface their content to the right audience at scale, and helps people discover content they, may, they might like. Uh, Adam found this, com found this company a few years back, and uh, as we were discussing, he's also served in the Israeli military uh, for a good seven years. That's a significant amount of time, Adam. Uh, he is now based in New York and he uh, runs this company from there. Tabula is not a listed company, not yet at least. Uh, their estimated revenues, uh, from what I've read, are in the region of $1 billion. You can uh, correct me if I'm wrong. In India, they work with uh, a large number of publishers. I'm told uh, the leading, some of the leading publishers like NDTV, Hindustan Times, Indian Express, Times of India, India Today, Danik Jagaran, Bhaskar, ABP, The Hindu, and several others work with uh, them. They also work with a lot of brands. Uh, Tabula uh, was founded in Israel, as I mentioned, and they are currently headquartered in New York. Uh, they do currently 150 billion monthly recommendations and have almost 400 million unique uh, visitors and more than 1 million content pieces that they put out. So Adam, uh, welcome to this uh, interaction. Uh, good to have you here. Thanks for uh, having me. Uh, before I uh, you know, get into uh, uh, the a business that Tabula is into. Tell us what's been going on. Uh, you uh, you uh, work very closely with content publishers, both news and uh, non-news alike. And we've seen uh, COVID has been, uh, you know, inflection point for digital news consumption in countries like India. Uh, digital consumption uh, of news as well as non-news has really gone up significantly. What are the some uh, four or five key uh, trends you've seen in uh, this increase in content consumption in the last few months? So, so first, thanks for having me and uh, hey everyone. Uh, for me, it's morning, um, so uh, a snowy morning, like uh, Nawai said. So, um, so, you know, I think overall when it just started in March 15th, um, you know, I think all of us just closed down and just wanted to see what's gonna happen. People wanted to wait it off. We've seen two types of behaviors. The first one was um, people that hoped this will end and we'll go back to normal, whatever normal was. And the second group was companies that uh, realized that something will never go back and we're going to have to change. And I think those two groups were, were very different. And those who did choose to change uh, today, um, you know, we're seeing them getting more success and things of that nature. And, and I'll give you some specifics. But, but overall, you know, um, there are a few things that we're seeing. The first one is that, um, the, the, the user behavior changed completely. People are at home. Um, they're leaning into a variety of different services, whether that's Disney Plus or HBO Max on their TV, websites, subscription services, direct to the reporter. So we've seen an increase in user attention. Um, so if you think of the user attention as an economy, um, it went up, right? Because we're home, we're not traveling, uh, we don't, we're not commuting. So something was created and we're filling that gap with consumption of a variety of services. Um, we're also not spending as we used to in terms of going to, you know, we don't have our annual trip on Christmas and we're not uh, going outside of our house like we used to, to, to purchase things in stores. So we, we're buying more online. So this behavioral change from the user and spending perspective uh, created a huge opportunity for both publishers and advertisers. Publishers to interact and engage consumers a lot more. Advertisers to reach consumers in ways they never did. That's right. Uh, so, so I think those two things um, actually will never go back. So even you know, post-vaccine, post-pandemic, um, advertisers realized that the opportunity to talk to the consumer directly and sell a product directly um, is, is something that users are ready for. Online education, online healthcare. Um, you know, these things, we thought it will take 10 years yes. for us to, to get there. In many ways, I feel like we're in 2030 already. Maybe we're even later than that. 
um, because it would have taken us 10 years to adopt to the behavior we're seeing right now. So I think that's a huge opportunity and challenge for those who have not adopted to this. That's right. In fact, uh, interesting point you make yesterday, uh, Boston Consulting Group uh, released a report in India which said uh, digital advertising spends uh, uh, that were uh, projected for the year uh, 2023 will happen next year. So it gets preponed by two years. Uh, right. And uh, you know nobody has a sense on uh, how much uh, digital content consumption and adoption has got kind of uh, fast track. Uh, possibly three to four years. That's a uh, guess. And uh, in countries like India, where telecom service providers, one of the largest ones today, or the largest one by number of subscribers, Reliance Geo la launched a few years back. And they brought in huge uh, a boom in content consumption through video on mobiles. And on the back of that, a huge digital economy has been created on which, you know, all these OTT live sports and many other platforms have been riding. So tell us, and, Adam, uh, you talk just, about, uh, yeah, go ahead. I'll just give an example on that one. I looked in preparation for spending some time with you today about what are people reading in India now versus before the pandemic. That's right. So what changed, what changed in the open web? So the, what, what's beautiful about the open web and journalism is that it's a great proxy for humans, real curiosity. Like you will never tell Facebook what you really care about because you don't want people to know. Like you will never tell them about your anxiety about healthcare or about some personal passion of yours because you might not want to share. You'll tell them about the things you want people to think or know that you like, right? right. But open web is different. You read about the things you really care about. So I thought that would be interesting to share with the audience. Um, but specifically in India, as an example, I wrote it down. So food delivery, uh, content around food delivery uh, went up 70%. Online education went up 70%. Healthcare, 65%. Finance, 35%, which is interesting as people are planning their future, mortgages, financial services. Um, so 35% increase versus before the pandemic over a long time. Gold went up 13%. Um, rainfall went up 76%, maybe you know, related to the rainfall. But if you're in the weather business, that's an opportunity. So all these, all these categories are really opportunities for advertisers to jump in and be the first to convert consumers to try the service. Yeah, that, that's very interesting because uh, uh, like you said, uh, social media platforms are, uh, are vanity platforms where you want the world to see you in a certain manner. And when you're consuming content online, whether it's news, non-news, uh, you know, you're doing it instinctively. You are, uh, you're not really thinking about somebody, you know, tracking what you're doing. Uh, tell us, Adam, a little bit uh, more about when you say, uh, you know, the pandemic will enhance uh, the advertiser's ability to reach the consumer directly. And, you know, uh, the digital world uh, uh, did that in many ways in the last few years. Advertisers were able to do that. But what do you think changes now? You know, uh, of course, content consumption has changed. Trackability remains the same, right? So how does the advertiser uh, uh, has better tools to reach out to consumers directly now? Well, I don't know that the tools now change versus, you know, eight months ago. Um, I think they, they are changing fast with the use of AI. I think that we're seeing personalization taking a huge part in how consumers expect the world to be and how advertisers can reach consumers. So we don't want, um, you know, we, don't, we only have 24 hours a day. So that, that will, by the way, never change. So I think, you know, in terms of AI and the use of AI, um, you know, Accenture predicts a huge growth in India over the next few years, um, you know, saying that by, two, by 2035, 50% of the country's gross value will be driven by AI. So I think whether that's in India or globally, that is a tool, if you will, that is changing the way advertisers interacting with consumers, the right messages, uh, meeting consumers earlier in the journey, not only with direct response ads, but for, you know, earlier with uh, content that they might like and try to personalize the experience for the consumer. So I think, I do think that's a big change. Um, the biggest change that happened in 2020, in my, in my opinion, is on the human side, not on the technology side. I don't think technology has enhanced dramatically in six months, but what enhanced dramatically is how we behave as people and what we expect. That's right. Um, so like I mentioned as an example, uh, if I told you in February that billions of luxury masks will be sold, you would think that I'm crazy. 
You know, if I told you that your kids will be spending eight hours a day on a screen talking to a teacher, you think I would, that I'm crazy. If I told you that you will interact with your doctor most of the time, you'll take your medicine, your prescription, advice on your iPhone, you, think, you would think I'm crazy. But all of that happens right now. So I, I do think that the biggest change happened on our side, on our side people. Um, and actually technology is now catching up on us because we're, we're already a step ahead. And the biggest enabler to all of that from a technology or tool perspective, I do believe is AI. Um, and um, it, it does worth for brands and publishers and tech you know, platforms to, uh, to invest a lot. My concern around AI is the over-reliance on, on AI. I speak about that quite often. You know, um, when I look at, as an example, even in 2020, global elections, people are home consuming media. How do you moderate for fake news? How do you moderate for hate content? How do you moderate for things that can hurt your kids and, and people that you love? So um, AI cannot do it solely. Uh, that, you know, I, I, um, I really believe that it's a, it's a big mistake to let machines solve the problem that was created by people, fake news. So, um, so I, I think AI is the biggest enabler it's not perfect. Um, and that's the tool that advances us. And I think the biggest change happened on our side. I'm going to pick you up. That's very interesting. I'm going to come back to the AI and, you know, news moderation bit a little later. Let me uh, now ask you on the other side, as I mentioned at the start, Kabula works with both uh, the publishers as well as the brands. Uh, since you also work, uh, work with many brands, what have you seen from the brand side? Uh, how have these last eight, nine months uh, impacted uh, a brand's approach to utilizing digital as a you know platform, and I ask this uh, for brands that uh, you know are uh, relatively lesser affected because of the pandemic. Of course, there were many categories, especially manufacturing, where uh, you know sales just fell off the cliff for many months. But if you look at uh, you know FMCG companies, you look at uh, banking, finance, uh, these uh, companies continue to do well. But have you seen uh, uh, there a, a fundamental change in the way they've approached? Uh, you know, the digital platforms, either as, you know, advertising tools or as business enhancement tools? So I think um, I'll, I will, I'll divide it to uh, advertisers that existed before the pandemic. And in those, you know, within those, I think you've seen initially brand advertisers holding back on, on advertising just because they have less of um, a metric that can attach a brand advertising to an immediate conversion. And when business is slowing down or when you're in a pandemic in a financial crisis, uh, performance advertising um, becomes more front um, in how you prioritize as a CMO or as a CEO or as a management team, you can't take the risk of thinking too long term when you now need to take care of the now. So I think we're, we've seen brand advertisers uh, pausing back in March and then rebounding heavily towards the end of the year. Um, We've seen performance advertisers um, really, really doubling down, um, you know, and, and the biggest thing that we've seen within that category is how they use data to know what to do. So everybody felt, you know, lost, you know, it, it was such a new thing for all of us globally. Um, most of us have never experienced a global pandemic before. Yeah. So um, it, when, you, when you're in that type of a fog, um, data can really be your, you know, compass to know what to do. So we, um, we've seen advertisers that um, use data to know what to advertise against more than before. Um, Tabula, we specifically, because of that thing that we saw advertisers do, we launched a website called trends.tabula.com, which exposed all of our data for free. We said, why don't you know everything we know about what people are reading in the open web and advertise against it. Um, and we saw interesting dynamics. We saw this food advertiser that stopped because they thought it's not a good time for them to, to do that. We showed them that it was 62% in the region where they actually delivered food. Uh, there was 62% of increase in readership of a food delivery. So they unpaused the campaign, launched a video campaign against it and drove growth to us. And it was a great case study of how um, data was more of a tool um, in the pandemic when you have no idea what to do. So I think we, we've, seen, uh, we've seen that change. And the, the third one that I, I would mention is the, the birth of new businesses um, that would have taken us years to see or would have never been born 
I don't think luxury masks That's right. that we're seeing now. I mean, I have 10 of them, you know, by car manufacturers, all the brands I love. I just buy, you know, I, I buy so many of them because I need to use them. So um, I don't think that, you know, and there are many categories like that. And, and those, those categories are new and relevant only because of the pandemic. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. Uh, let me ask you about, you know, uh, the challenges, you know, we've, we've all seen uh, Google and Facebook uh, have really dominated the advertising uh, spends in the digital uh, business for many years now. And publishers across the world uh, have faced uh, many challenges. Some publishers in Western countries have managed to uh, at least break the subscription uh, model to some extent, I would say. Yeah. Uh, Indian publishers have had major challenges. So if you look at, uh, you know, this year 2020, how would you define this year for publishers? And I ask this because you have a very good view of where publishers stand in terms of, you know, the traction they get on content. On one hand, content consumption is going up. People are spending more time on, uh, uh, on, on uh, publisher platforms. Is uh, revenue ever going to catch up in a commensurate manner? What do publishers need to do? What can they do given that, you know, uh, Google, Facebook, in the foreseeable future will uh, continue to control the digital advertising market the way it is going? Well, revenue, I think, is already coming back a lot of it. In eight, the, the second half of 2020 was a way stronger, um, you know, period than the first half. And some territories, some verticals report even stronger than H2 of last year. So I think that um, from just overall programmatic dollars, performance dollars, um, revenue that came in um, in a more of an automatic way, we've seen a very strong rebound in the second half of the year. I think brand advertising um, is, you know, is coming back and, and you know, pending how you're using data to help those uh, brand advertisers come back, you're seeing the rebound. So overall, I, I think that um, if some publishers share that they're having a great Q4, um, some not yet, but I, I suspect they will soon. So overall, on, on that front, I think things are coming back, and that's great. The, um, the biggest opportunity publishers have now uh, is one, uh, like I said, users, to some extent, changed forever. We're now open to subscribe to things, to uh, sign up to a newsletter, uh, and to connect in ways we never did before. There's a reason why you know, OTT is so successful. We're, we love direct to consumer services. We're happy to pay for them. We're happy to pay for different subscription services, be in touch with someone. We need guidance, we feel alone, you know, and, and some of that behavioral change um, is there forever. That is a huge opportunity, not necessarily to, um, you know, not that, I don't think subscription services and newsletters will replace advertising, but I think it's a very good way to connect. I think it's a very good way to diversify. Um, and it's a very good way to know what your audience, your loyal readers want. So that is an opportunity for, for, um, for publishers that I think um, I really believe people should, should tap into. Um, and from, from an advertiser perspective, like I said, the biggest opportunity right now, I think is to use data to know what to advertise against beyond what you think you know, because everything changed. So even if you think you know your demographics, um, you know, that, that you should use data to, to try to know where to go. The, re, the, the challenge you have is that as a CMO, everybody's now overspending. So how do you find the right person that will discover your brand versus someone else's brand? You know, so, um, so I, think, I think that's, and, and I would say more midterm. So maybe not 2020, but a few years. I'm super optimistic about publishers. The reason is when I look at services like Apple News, um, that's a two trillion dollar company, Apple. They're good. It's a good company, um, and they decided to integrate content in the most intimate way into their multi-billion dollar devices. Which means Apple thinks content is important. And usually, when you see a company that's as good as Apple make a decision like that, you should suspect there's a revolution coming in other areas. So I am, I'm optimistic because I believe that we will see content getting integrated everywhere, in your car, in your fridge, in your audio devices. Um, 
We're seeing it in, in devices. So I suspect we're gonna read a lot and have text to audio a lot um, beyond your browser over the next two, three, four, five years. And, and I would expect journalism, local news, national news will become the glue between me and all of the devices around me. So I, I, I bet journalism and I, I'm optimistic about it. Um, and I think we're coming out of 2020 better than we definitely started 2020. Yeah, we all hope so. So uh, this, this should mean a, a lot many more opportunities for Tabula if a company like Apple is so focused on content. Uh, for you guys, this, this will open a whole new uh, list of opportunities because that means more publishers. Uh, that means more content online, uh, more uh, page views, uh, and uh, more opportunities for you to serve. Yeah, I mean, look, first of all, um, I think that um, Tabula, sir, what Tabula's mission in, is, is exclusively focused on the open web, right? We, Google is for search, Facebook is for social, Amazon is for e-commerce, Tabula is for the rest of the world. Right. And I think that the rest of the world matters a lot. We all need, you know, uh, Andy TV, Industan Time, India Today. We need those publishers to, to be very, very strong so we can get guidance that protects us from pharma, protects us from politicians, give us local guidance in a pandemic. We need that to survive and be strong. Um, so I, I think that, um, you know, I'm optimistic about the existing open web and how it can grow. Like I mentioned, because I think the open web will be distributed in many other places. Um, and for us as a company, we, I hope that we'll continue to make win-win type decisions that are very aligned to, um, to the open web. Tell us, uh, Adam, since you work with publishers across the world, uh, let me come to specifically Indian publishers. Have you seen uh, issues uh, Indian publishers vis-a-vis -vis publishers in Western worlds? Uh, are there any uh, uh, difference in terms of how they approach business and the uh, issues they face? Of course, uh, money, revenue, monetization is, is an issue for everyone, right? Uh, but if you were to go down to a nuanced level, how do you see them working differently vis-a-vis -vis some of the counterparts in the Western world? It's a very good question because um, people tend to think that the web is the web is the web, but, but it's not always true. And there's something very special that companies can learn from the Indian market, uh, user behavior and how they consume content. So as an example, first of all, it's a, it's a huge market. So you have over a billion people that consume content in the open web in India. So you have a lot of scale, um, which is very different than most other places in the world. Um, it's a huge market. Um, it's $8 billion in media spend a year. So it's a, it's a market worth pursuing in India. Um, and the digital portion of it is growing 33%. Uh, into next year right. so overall it's a big a lot of people and a big market so let's start with the top and then more specifically to me what's very unique about the market and what companies like tabula can learn is um is probably the mobile element of it so if you subscribe to a future that is not um mostly mobile but maybe only mobile uh india is probably the best place in the world to learn about the future so you, you, you're seeing a lot more consumers meeting the internet for the first time via a small device, um, spending most of their time on a small device. And that um, is probably a proxy for what the rest of the world will look like in a few years. So I think that's something that from an advertiser perspective and a publisher perspective is very different than uh, you know, an enterprise publisher in the US or in the UK or in Australia. Right, so um, I think from an advertising perspective in mobile, conversion to performance advertisers in mobile, brand messages, big impact placements, ad formats that are great in mobile, all those things are, we're, we're few steps ahead in India and that makes company, companies like us think harder about how to make that market successful. And when you sit down and have conversations with the Indian publishers, what are the three, four, uh, you know, takeaways that uh, uh, few issues that 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 they, they, they need uh, tabula to nail down? You know, it's, it's a, a lot of time it's about the editorial team. Um, how can we um, support the workflows, the people that write, how we can uh, be part of growing that team from a monetization perspective, how we can optimize revenue with the purpose of uh, growing the editorial team. So a, a lot of our um, conversations are focused on editorial workflows. We have a product called Newsroom, yeah. which is a product that is uh, tailored just to the work, uh, the editorial staff. So as an example, if you're uh, a publisher in India, how can you learn about what your readers 
read on other sites and in the in India in, in the open web? How how can you learn which pieces of content convert to subscription? Uh, so you can write more about it. So you can uh, spark that curiosity for your consumers. So a lot I would say a lot of my conversations. Um, with publishers in India and some of my best best friends, Suparna from NDTV and, and others are are from that from the market. A lot of times it's amazing how editorial first publishers in India are um, more than other markets, which is very special to me. Uh, they're will, really working from their heart. Um, and that means that a lot of their decision and conversation with us is around the people on the ground that actually create the content we all need to consume. Interesting. Yes. Uh, let me come to, uh, you know, since we've been talking about digital advertising, let me come to another aspect of digital as advertising. I recently had a it for Google, uh, Sanjay Gupta. Uh, Sanjay's view uh, was that uh, in the next few years uh, in India, digital advertising growth will be driven by small businesses. It's happening world over of these large uh, you know, walled internet companies. Uh, if I look at what Tabula has done uh, so far, uh, your primary forte has been uh, bringing brands and publishers together, right, and serving the consumer. Uh, what I see is the brands that you've largely worked with are, you know, the big ones, the, you know, the marquee ones with a lot of money to spend. How does Tabula uh, now curate the next, you know, uh, 10,000 or 100,000 set of advertisers, the small guys, the guy who has, you know, $5,000 or $10,000 to spend uh, and then create a long tail of advertising because that's where growth, especially in countries like India is going to come from. How do you get relevance for that? Yeah, so there, there are two types of smaller businesses and even long tail over time um, on the advertiser side and on the publisher side. On the advertiser side, we launched a self-service few years back um, to allow basically anyone to go to Tabula website, start a campaign um, at a very small budget and use the same capabilities that a big brand can use and get going and be discovered in the open web. And we're, that business has grown uh, quite significantly. So it's already over a hundred million dollar business for us, which we've announced uh, when that happened. And um, and what's interesting is that a lot of times those advertisers are the best advertisers. You know, it's the small businesses. Um, they have, a, they have, it's entrepreneurs, founders that have a, have a product and, you know, new headphones or different cool services. And then by the way, many of them mature into our enterprise service where they have an account manager and because they become so big, they need a lot of attention. So, um, so, so we do have that for, um, for smaller businesses on the advertiser side. On the publisher side, we're not there yet. And, um, and I'm not sure that would be a short-term initiative to, you know, to launch blogs and smaller sites. That takes a different type of technology and processes that we don't yet have. Um, but on the advertiser side, I'm very excited about small businesses and self-service in general. And funny enough, since we launched it, thinking it will be mainly for smaller businesses, I can tell you some of our biggest advertisers prefer to use the self-service versus talking to people. So you just see what's interesting is when you put yourself out there, you discover how people want to use your product in ways you didn't think they would, which is great, you know, because that, that's a good way to, uh, it keeps you humble and makes you better. So, um, so it, it is live. It's used um, by smaller businesses, but also some of our biggest advertisers use it. Fantastic. Uh, let me uh, come to a very, uh, you know, the most, the fastest growing area in, uh, you know, digital, at least as far as India is concerned, video, right? Video has seen huge boom in the last few years. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the India's uh, largest telecom mm -hmm. provider with their, uh, you know, almost free data plans was instrumental in this uh, boom. Today, sports content, uh, IPL, which is the Premier League, which is the India's largest sport sporting event, is consumed uh, billions of minutes uh, every season. Tabula is a company that started, uh, I won't say in the pre-video era, but you know, uh, six, seven, eight years back when video was not that big. Do you think uh, you know uh, you've been a little late in catching up on the video thing? Because what I see is largely you know text-driven text uh, work that Tabula is doing. 
So, but funny enough, I started Taboola as a video recommendation company, just so you know, because um, I couldn't find anything to watch on TV. And so the, actually the first few years of Taboola were just video recommendation service with no advertising business. Um, so funny enough, we're closing a, a circle on that. We, um, video is a, is, is a not insignificant part of our business now. We've acquired a company in 2016 called Convert Media, right. which basically what we had a feed product integrated across the web and we, we followed some of Instagram uh, evolution from the product perspective and how they integrated feed uh, video in the feed. And we thought that's a really engaging way to, um, to surface videos to consumers. We, we figured there's going to be the YouTubes of the world when you go to a video website to watch a video and then you, and there's the rest of the world where you stumble upon video, right? It's not so much of a video website, but video is part of the experience. That's right. And we, as, as we analyzed that, we, we thought that video in feed um, could be bigger than YouTube, right? So if you think of all the impressions in the world outside of YouTube collectively, when we, when we read, if video was part of that, video would be huge for everyone. So the question is how you can do it in a way that's relevant, personalized, um, engaging, and good for advertisers and publishers alike with right. users in the middle. So that's, first of all, that, that's our go-to-market strategy. We've acquired a company called Convert Media to execute on that vision and basically integrate feed uh, video into our feed. Um, that has grown um, significantly for us. And helped our publishers generate a lot of revenue. Brands really like it. It's very visible. Viewability is great. Completion uh, rates are great. Um, and in general, I think that um, as TV is moving to, to digital um, and, and as publishers are looking to grow revenue, video will be one of the best ways to do it. But it's not going to be how we used to do it. Publishers used to move a user from, from an article page to a video page. Publishers used to have a small YouTube section on their site. And it's very difficult to convert a reader to a video experience like that. But I think if you do, if you do the opposite and, and bring the video section into the article experience and make it infinite, like Instagram, uh, like TikTok, um, you'll, you'll find that consumers really engaged with it. And that's a great opportunity for publishers to become YouTube websites. Um, so my, my belief is that the future is an open web that looks like Instagram with video part of it. Yeah, I think video will be a very, very uh, large instrumental part of uh, what brands are going to do on the web and also where the consumer consumption trends are headed. You know, everybody is, like you mentioned, Adam, everybody is caught on to content today. You know, content is the game in town when it comes to uh, publishers trying to get traction, whether it is text content, video content, or brands using content to reach out to those consumers via these publisher websites. What that has led to is two things. One, humongous amounts of fragmentation, right? Because everybody's doing the same thing. And they are all doing it at the same time and they're doing it multiple times over. So if you had to tell uh, a brand, a CMO, three, four, you know, key important things to follow when you are uh, uh, creating a content led strategy uh, to be on uh, publisher platforms, what would those things be in today's world, a post COVID world, so to say? Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, I mentioned data and data is, um, I, I don't believe everything is the same. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a huge signal that happens when someone is behaving in a certain way. So, so I think um, data is a good guide to, to break your beliefs about what you think you know. Um, so you should always have your demographic packages and, and going after the market you think you're going, but then let data make, enable you to make mistakes uh, and open up. So I think my, my, first, um, you know, my first advice would be to make mistakes using data. Explore yourself, that's the first one. The second one is to don't do the obvious. It's much easier to work with the top 20% of the market the top 30% of the market uh, to work with Google and Facebook. Um, so I think diversity really matters um, in terms of- How many CMOs uh, do you find who are willing to take that risk? I think CMOs really want to take their, that risk, but a lot of times they're very busy and the people that executed the campaigns are not them. Right. So 
So those who execute any campaigns, you know, they don't necessarily have the appetite to learn how to work with a different publisher, to work with a different platform. So I think, I, I do think CMOs have an overall strategy to diversify their campaigns and not be relying on any one channel. But a lot of times, you know, these are huge organizations with thousands of, of media buyers that have, um, you know, find it harder to actually execute on that. So I, I think, but I think that's important because the, the, the last thing we want is Google and Facebook having every, all of our budget, controlling prices, controlling product innovation, controlling our success, owning our future. So that is just a very bad future, you know? So we, the, um, it's important to do that. So I think data to make mistakes, diversity, um, you know, in terms of, of your, your channel spend, um, I, think, I think that's important. By the way, I think also from more of a humanity perspective, if I was a CMO, um, I would also look at just DEI as a, as, a, as a topic and just diversity in general and try to think how as a CMO, I can make an impact on the topic of diversity, you know, equity, inclusion. I see some agencies and CMOs talking to me about it. I think it's amazing, right? So as a CMO, you have an opportunity to dictate and decide where things are going. That's right. Um, right? So that means I spoke about diversity from a budget perspective, but that you can also make an impact on, on humanity by supporting small businesses that are owned by diverse communities, yep. by supporting um, you know, different businesses that if they succeed, it will, you know, it will enable more diversity. So I think you know, money is not money all the time. You know, there's different ways of spending it and using it. And I, I really think all of us as, uh, you know, leaders, CMOs, uh, head of publishers, head of advertisers, people like you that, you know, talk to the world. Uh, we have an opportunity to, especially after 2020, uh, to think differently about the future. And I believe, by the way, it will drive business growth. Like, I don't think you're doing this because you're just holistic. I think you're doing it because it's the right thing to do and it will do good for business as well. You know, so, um, so, so I think, you know, I spoke about data, I spoke about diversity of channels, I spoke about impact on, on you know, beyond gross margin and business and things like that. And that's why I would uh, strongly encourage people to make a DEI a topic for, for them to discuss. Uh, and lastly, I would try to, if I was a CMO, I would measure how many people do I have their email or their phone or a way to connect with them directly, not through anyone? How many people can I talk to directly? I think that is the biggest user behavioral change of 2020. And if you think we're going back to nobody wants to sign in future, you're, you're, you're living in the past. That's right. I think that's a well-made point, Adam. Uh, you mentioned about, uh, you know, Apple, uh, reading content for their devices and uh, as we've seen facebook has been going after apple uh, in the past few days what's your view on that and does that also impact the digital publishing uh, environment because if uh, uh, you know data availability is going to be restricted by companies like apple then it does impact the digital publishing and digital advertising uh, business well, Apple has already impacted the open web by blocking third-party cookies a few years ago. That's right. Um, so I think what we're seeing right now is a different type of giants talking to each other um, with us little people in the middle. Um, and then, but right now what you're seeing is more of a native app, yeah. um, you know, privacy discussion, which obviously affects Facebook. Uh, more because most of their business is in an app environment. So I think the current dynamics are less relevant for the majority of the open web journalism because most of the journalism um, traffic is still either mobile web, AMP, tablet, or desktop. So when it's mobile for publishers, a lot of time, it's not necessarily the app. App is a, is a good business, but a lot of time the mobile web version and the AMP will supersede by a lot the app traffic. Some publishers, it's different for them, but I would say categorically, it's not. Um, so I think that the, the, face, the, the Facebook, Apple discussions right now are less relevant because they're, they're mainly tailored around the native app. Um, and in that world, we're less reliant on that as publishers. Saying that, 
you know, the dynamics around privacy are very important. You know, we, we all want a better private future for consumers because I'm not sure my mom understands when she goes on a website, who tracks her and what follows her and all those things. So I really want the web to be safe. Saying that, I think we need a mechanism for advertisers to succeed in the open web. Um, so I think Google is doing a good job leading discussions on replacing cookies with a different mechanism. And I, I trust this, I trust they'll do the right thing. Um, so, um, you know, I, I do think it's the right approach and attitude. We do want a better private future than the craziness that we've seen, you know, in the last 20 years. Saying that, I do think we want to eliminate um, the opportunity to personalize and make the web relevant. So that's, um, but that's going to take two years or three years to evolve. Nevertheless, I think the Apple Facebook thing doesn't really affect publishers necessarily uh, as much. Tell me the, uh, the cookie-less future does impact publishers and by virtue of that, it also impacts companies like Tabula. What's your take on that? How do you get around that? How do you prepare for a cookie-less future? Because yeah. you know, if that's, not, uh, that's not going to happen. All the tracking uh, mechanisms you've cre created in the last few years, they kind of become redundant. No, not, not really, because I, I, I'll tell you, first of all, um, it might be completely the opposite. So first of all, Safari has been around with third-party cookies been blocked for a while. Yes. And so we're already, we're already again, in the future, looking back at a cookie-less world in many ways, right? So I think it, we shouldn't expect, and Safari, by the way, has a lot of market share globally. Um, some countries less, but, you know, in, in a heavy Android market. But, but, um, but overall, Safari and Apple, you know, they have good market share. So I think we've already seen some of it. Um, and and the, the second thing is that, um, do I think programmatic companies that rely on retargeting and things like that are impacted? Yes, because it's much harder to retarget and do things of that nature in a cookie-less world. Um, companies like Tabula and publishers, by the way, that have a very strong signal for what you currently read, I don't think that this is um, going to be a huge problem for them because there's something very, very important that advertisers need side by side to an article. So when you read about um, on a technology section on a, of a news website or an automobile website, when you read about something like that, I'm telling you, your signal for curiosity and being in that market is a lot more than you told Facebook you like cars. Okay, because you're now reading about it. So I think that even in a cookie-less world, one, the signal of the open web is very strong. Two, I don't think cookies are going to die and will be with nothing. I think cookies will be replaced with a safer, better mechanism. And the analogy I'll make is when Flash, if you remember Apple killed Flash, I don't know, 10 years ago, they re it was replaced with HTML5. HTML5 gave us the capabilities of we used to enjoy with Flash online, but much safer, much lighter, right? So I, th I think that's what I think is going to happen. Fair point. Uh, let me uh, come to uh, the recent uh, big news uh, about your merger call off with Outbrain. I'll spend uh, uh, limited time on that, but tell us uh, why you were doing the merger and uh, uh, does that set, set you back and how do you kind of, you know, continue with your growth plans despite the merger not happening? I mean, look, I mean, I think first of all, it was a, it was a you know, very engaging and intense experience for everyone. Uh, we, both companies did it, uh, got into that engagement because we, we wanted to do it and we wanted to succeed. Um, I think we didn't anticipate it will take longer than we thought and, um, and the pandemic will happen. And, and, you know, so things happen that we didn't anticipate when we, we got into that. But for the most part, I can just tell you, we met amazing people. Um, you know, many of them will stay friends with. I mean, this is not personal. Um, if anything, we, we met great people that uh, we were impressed by. Um, and we, you know, we learned from each other as, you know, uh, what's our inspiration about the open web and things of that nature. So it was very, you know, good experience on that front. Um, I think we didn't anticipate the pandemic. We didn't anticipate it will take so much so longer. And at the end, it didn't work for both of us, but not for any reason, but the fact that we thought we have a better future independently. So I think this was, um, you know, both companies made a decision together to move on um, and, and we moved on, but uh, I'm sure they'll be okay. And Tabula is, um, is in a very strong place uh, to invest uh, in the future from a product perspective. 
you know, keep expanding in all directions I mentioned. So uh, I could not be more optimistic and bullish about the future than I am now. And, um, and I wish my friends in Outbrain good luck. Thanks, uh, Adam. Uh, let me come to a video because as we, as we uh, discussed, video is the future of content consumption online. Uh, and video is there in many parts. Do you see uh, content publishers, one, slow in catching up on video because uh, truth is that if you leave out uh, native television content producers, the other publishers are not really, they don't have uh, video in their DNA, right? Whereas the consumer is looking uh, inherently, instinctively for video content today. So uh, what, what do you think is the way for content publishers to catch up on video content curation because that's where the world is headed? And how does Tabula kind of uh, play that game? Because, you know, uh, that's as we discussed in the future. Yeah, I think it's, an, it's a wrong assumption to think that users are looking for video. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's the case at all. I think they look for video when they open Netflix. They look for videos, maybe when they go to a broadcaster like NDTV. Uh, but those are very specific situations when the brand is a video brand. It was born to be video, it is video, they'll do video, it's a video brand. For the rest, I don't think we should assume users look for videos. I don't think we should assume we can convert them to look for videos. We should do exactly the opposite. We should bring videos to them. So I strongly think that if, let's take a simple example, let's say you're an automobile blog. You have no video production. You, you don't have a video section. You can do one in two things of two things. You can create a video tab. So people go and watch videos on your site, which is your YouTube on your site. There's a video section people would go and then you create videos or you embed videos from YouTube or your syndicate or all those things. Or the other way around, you can bring videos into the articles themselves. So I read about um, Toyota and in the article, I have a feed with videos that are relevant for the article. I strongly believe the second option is what is going to be the video growth for the open web because I don't think people are aware that there's that I'm supposed, I don't think users are aware that we're supposed to have, have a video section unless the brand is a video brand from the moment it was born, like YouTube, Netflix or NDTV or CNN or NBC news. I don't think we should expect users to change behavior. So we have to bring videos to them. But you have every publisher, uh, especially I'm talking about news publishers here. Everybody's chasing videos, even the, you know, non uh, television native companies, everybody is going doubling down on video. So do you think they are, uh, they're getting it wrong. No, there, I mean, I, I think again, if you're a vid, if you're a native video company, I'm saying not native video companies. Yeah, if you're not a native video company and you're doubling down on video, the question is, how do you surface that video through your consumer? If you're doubling down on video and you're putting all those videos in a video section, I think you're going to fail. It will be uniquely hard to convert readers to video watchers. If you're in doubling down on video and you're putting those videos where users already spend their time, you're going to be massively successful because, and that is, by the way, that is the Instagram, Facebook case study. Instagram had two options, launch a video tab or bring videos into the feed. That's right. Yeah. And what did they do to fight YouTube? They did not launch a YouTube. They brought YouTube into the feed. So again, I, I don't think Instagram made the wrong decision. People were already scrolling on the feed. The way to, to fight YouTube for Facebook was to bring YouTube into the feed, uh, not, to, not to launch a, a YouTube section. So I believe doubling down on video is the best thing you can do, whether it's creation, syndication, aggregation, uh, but I think it's mainly about the user experience and how you do it, if that makes sense. And as we know, Instagram has now done both. They've also launched Reels within the app, so you also have videos within the feed and you have a separate tab also. So, you know, they've done both in a way. Nice. So uh, let me come to another uh, topic you touched upon, which is fake news and, uh, you know, content seeding uh, has also led to this huge industry that has spawned where uh, you are, you know, putting out content, which is coming from 
uh, unknown, uh, unreliable sources, uh, and a lot social media platforms obviously have been accused of uh, you know allowing uh, fake news to get populated on their massive platforms, and nobody really has been able to uh, you know put down a meaningful solution. Like you mentioned at the start, AI is not a you know solution. AI can't solve a human created problem because you know at least as of today human brain is far ahead of whatever we have created uh, in the computers. Uh, so if we were to look at the interim term, uh, 12, 4, 24 months, do you think uh, the problem of fake news is going to go up multiple times over? Um, no, I mean, I think we're uh, much more aware of this topic than we used to. So I don't suspect it will, the trend is negative. Uh, I think that um, in 2020, we spoke about, especially around the elections and all of that, but we spoke about fake news um, and the importance of content moderation by an order of magnitude more yeah. than we did in the past. So I actually think um, we're doing the right thing. We're talking about it. You're talking about it. CNBC is talking about it. Bloomberg is talking about it. Everybody's talking about it. So uh, I think we're, we're seeing the right trend of, um, of bringing it up to an awareness. The um, a few things. One, I don't think if it's a non unknown, you mentioned unknown brand it's necessarily bad. Um, in fact, I think we should not allow ourselves to think that. What's great about the open web is the opportunity for anyone to share their voice yeah. and to be discovered by people. So we shouldn't be in a future that only the New York Times survives, right? We don't want that. New York Times is great, we need more. We want opinion, we want diversity, we want to give a chance to smaller businesses and so forth. So I, have, I don't think unknown is the problem. I think problems are the problems. You know, if you are doing something bad, that's bad. So then the question is, how do you moderate? What do you do? What resources do you put in place to make sure that the web is safe? Yeah. So my opinion is that um, AI can help you, but you have to start a team of humans, people that actually are engaged church and state. Nobody can talk to them. There is a public policy. Yeah. Say what you think is wrong. Put it out there. If you're a platform, if you're a publisher, if you're whoever you are that interacts with consumers, say this is wrong. That's what I don't want to do. And give people a chance to react to your policy and start a team of people that will moderate it. We now have more at, at Tabula more than 50 people that moderate over a million URLs a month. Um, reading pages and the reason and we have and we have you know a huge r d in israel and la and so it's not about ai you know uh, deficiencies we have a lot of it it's just not good enough it will never be good enough to moderate new things there was this case on tiktok that um there was a tag on tiktok that uh, kids uploaded videos and they said eating pasta for dinner and it sounds perfectly fine but it what it people realized after a while is that when kids uploaded videos with eating pasta for dinner, I, I read, I read about it. Obviously I, I didn't know about it. Otherwise it, it was a sign of kids that um, were considering committing suicide. AI would never know that eating dinner, you know, pasta for dinner means a shouting out for help. Yeah. Um, and a content narration team picked it up and parents picked it up. So, I think that um, the solution has to involve humans alongside AI. If I was Facebook, I would hire 50,000 people to do it um, and moderate everything all the time. Uh, against the policy, not to block the unknown, not to block free speech, but to block every fake news, hate, and things that should not, that should not be out there anywhere. That's, yeah, I think, I think one of the key things is for companies to put adequate resources to do it. Uh, that's the starting step. And then right. uh, is the next step of being able to moderate it, not black it out, but uh, uh, there are gray areas there also, right? I mean, there is something which is obviously fake news and uh, the other part, which is more, uh, you know, gray area where there is different, differing opinions. So at least the first part can be tackled very easily, which is clearly uh, fake news. The second part can be taken on later, but I think the first thing that is required is for adequate resources resources to be uh, put in to moderate this content. We have just two, three minutes left, Adam. So before we go, I want to talk about Tabula's plan uh, 
uh, plans now that the merger has been uh, called off? Are you planning to uh, do an IPO? Are you planning a fundraise? Uh, how does uh, Tabula grow from here? How does how do the next three years look like? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, there's nothing I can share in terms of specific plans, but in general, Tabula is in a very good place. I'm very fortunate for you know, our people's health, our partners, um, you know, sticking strong and weathering the storm together. So I feel very lucky. Um, you know, my dad is a musician. He hasn't played on stage for almost a year. So you see just the very different ways people um, re you know, receive the pandemic. So overall, I'm, I'm very lucky and I feel, um, you know, um, gifted to be here today and talk to you and about the future and all those things. Specifically, um, you know, we're looking to the future. There are two areas we're going to look at. The first one is, you know, how we can recommend more type of things such as, you know, uh, e-commerce and more video and some of the things we talked about today. And that will make our yield better and experience for consumers better. And, and the second thing um, as a growth opportunity is how we can expand beyond uh, the browser and bring our publisher news into anywhere people spend their time. So, you know, I think test labs should be sold with Tabula inside of them, you know, and surfacing news by all these great publishers from India. So I'm shocked Tesla is not sold with um, Tabula inside of it, but, you know, hopefully one day. So my point is that anything that I'm interacting with should have Tabula inside um, and surfacing me, you know, in the same time and, and the TV and all the publishers I love. So um, I, the second area of growth for us is Tabula everywhere um, and bringing those relevant premium quality personalized news anywhere I may spend my time on. So those two things will take us for the next five, 10 years. Um, you know, you mentioned we're over a billion dollars in gross revenue company. We're profitable, we're growing fast. It's a over $60 billion advertising market globally in the open web. Um, and I think the open web needs someone that is exclusively passionate about just the open web, not a platform with an identity crisis, not, you know, someone that just cares open web. And that's, that's who we are. If I may add lesser controversy, thank you so much, Adam, uh, for joining us on a early Friday morning there. It's almost nighttime here. The sun has already set in Mumbai. Uh, we wish you luck. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned at the start, uh, Tabula is a company which is godsend for uh, publishers, especially in India. Uh, where revenues, uh, especially in a COVID world, are uh, not easy to come by and a large share is taken away by uh, what we call these wall gardens. So most Indian publishers will uh, uh, wish that you bring in more revenue to them and, uh, uh, and uh, they continue to create more traction, they continue to create more uh, user engagement. Thank you and it was a very enjoyable session. I hope uh, people who joined in uh, liked it. Uh, we'll be happy to uh, you know, send you any questions that uh, come post the session. I'm told we have limited time since you have another session. Good luck to you and thank you for joining us. Stay well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.